Hi. Um, so uh, I'm Theo. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I am one of the employees at Alembic. Uh, we build cool stuff with Elixir. Uh, so this is going to be just a sort of high level overview of testing in Phoenix Live View uh, written by, by a beginner. I learned most of this stuff about five, six weeks ago. So we're, we're all coming into it together. Um, so before we start, yeah, so it covers the use of the live view test module specifically to create what most people would consider integration level tests. Um, obviously, you can still use XUnit uh, for your basic unit testing that's tried and true, but this does sort of cover more integration level stuff. Um, it's written from my learnings as a beginner. Um, so this is just a little taster, contrary to what Paul said. Unfortunately, it's not the be all end all, um, but it, it, it will show you sort of a broad overview of what's possible with the live view test module um, and how flexible it can be. If you're interested in learning more after the talk, I, I highly recommend the testing live view course by Herman Velasco. Um, that's where I've sort of learned a heap of my knowledge around testing live view and so, uh, where sort of the code examples have uh, been sort of inspired. Uh, so I've got that link to the source code in the Zoom chat. Have a mosey around if you'd like to see how it all sort of hangs together. Um, but other than that, let's get into so how you sort of manufacture these basic tests. Um, so, you know, the first thing you sort of want to do when you're poking around in live view is test that your components are rendering correctly. Um, so I've got this little test here. This whole sort of presentation is using uh, that repo, which is kind of like a Twitter clone because it's a sort of well-known model. So this test is written trying out that the user can visit the homepage of um, our Twitter app. So we've got our uh, connector there. It, we, we have our sort of three item tuple. So you've got your OK response, the view, which is sort of your interactive live view and the HTML, which is, you know, your static template that is actually getting returned. Um, so once we sort of pull those out and destructure it, we can assert either that our static HTML has uh, some sort of content in it or that our rendered view has some content in it. Now, there's a key difference here. So testing the static HTML is all well and good if you sort of don't have um, any state that might be affecting the rendering that's going on here. But if you do have anything stateful that could be affecting the content in the actual layout of your page, you do want to be rendering that live view because that's how we test interactivity in our live view testing. Um, so here's a good example. We've got a test to check that the current user can see their own avatar. Um, now in this test, we've got a little helper method off to the side that sets up a logs in a user just for convenience sake. So again, we've got that three item tuple. We're not going to use the static HTML here because we are going to have a stateful sort of effect on this component. And then what we do is to grab uh, sort of a point to hook our test into, we call the element function. So um, the element function is taking in our view, so our live view. Um, and it's also taking in either, it'll be, you can use either a CSS selector or you can use a regex expression. But here we've got an image where the source is equal to the user's avatar URL. So here we're asserting that the user can in fact see their own specific avatar and it's not just you know, a placeholder image or the image if it doesn't render, then obviously this test will break and that's an issue. Um, so that's sort of where we get into the specifics of these stateful things. Uh, beyond rendering, obviously you wanna be able to test your click interactions. So uh, we've got a test here, when a user clicks on a post, uh, it should sort of highlight that post and go into it like you do in Twitter. So um, we've got uh, X Machina sort of handling our model insertion and creation for our tests here. Uh, so it builds a post with insert post, we do our connection, and we take our view, pipe it through to our element call. Um, so here we're grabbing a post with a post's ID uh, from that post that got created. And we've got something here called data roll. Um, now, these are really handy when you might have an element that 
doesn't have other unique CSS selectors that you can sort of hook into. Um, you can do this data role like I've done in this uh, project here. Something we've been using at Alembic as well is data test so that it makes it really clear to other developers that might be working in the same repository uh, that they are looking at something that is hooked into a test and that will potentially be affecting tests. So that's a useful sort of little tidbit there. Um, that post up body at the end there, that's a text filter. So this is specifically targeting the body of our post that we've created. And then you can pass that into a render click function. So render click will work on any component or element that has a PHX click event, and that will just trigger the event like the user has clicked on it. So in this test, we're asserting that once the user has clicked on it, um, our rendered view has the element show post with our specific posts ID. So yeah, um, we can also do a similar thing and use our render click to test redirects in navigational elements. So um, here we're te testing our user can navigate to their user settings by clicking on their own avatar, uh, just like you do in Twitter. So. Um, we have our view, we're passing that through to the element call and we're grabbing the ID user avatar. Um, there should only be one of those on the page. Um, we're rendering the click onto that component that got selected and we can then call follow redirect, which is a handy little sort of helper to let us test whether our routes are correct. So here we're expecting our uh, redirect to follow our user settings path. Um, and you can then assert that the response contains specific uh, objects, just like you would with your components in our previous tests. So this is a very simple example where we're making sure it renders the word settings, but you could have all sorts of things in here. Um, yeah, so that's the majority of the basic stuff. Now things get a bit more spicy when we're talking about uh, messaging. So you know, you've got three general sort of, I guess, groups of methods for testing messaging across your live viewer. Um, so each of the methods I'm about to show you has its own specific benefits and drawbacks, but those um, are largely going to be influenced by how your code is written or planning to be written if you're doing TDD, which you definitely should. Um, it will make your life a lot easier. So. The first of our methods here, we have our direct method. So we're sending the event directly by targeting the views process ID. Now, this is the most decoupled of the three approaches that I'm going to show you, which is fantastic, obviously, but it can be prone to false positives, which makes it quite brittle to use. So this kind of test can still pass um, even if there are issues with how messages are being sent in your code itself because you are sending it directly via the test. So that can be kind of dangerous. Um, the way that this is being done is, yeah, we're literally just sending our uh, post-created uh, message straight to the view from the test itself. So yeah, highly decoupled, but also highly brutal. We've got method two, which is uh, calling PubSub itself if you're using PubSub. So uh, this is testing the same thing, but using PubSub. So it also implicitly tests that our messaging in our app is working, which is kind of nice. Um, but look, it can be kind of flaky as well. So if your message format or the message um, event changes, then you know, we might get a false positive because it's being declared very, uh, very, what's the word? Uh, it's being declared uh, straight up here. It, it's sort of hard coded. You've got your timeline topic uh, hard coded here. It's not being passed in from any of your other modules where it might be used in the app. Um, and then our third method is calling our core domains item function. Um, so here we've got like timeline dot create post, and then we've got our params and so on. Now, 
this is the most coupled of the three approaches. So it's deeply coupled to the implementation, which means that changing code that's sort of unrelated to broadcasting can still break the test. Um, but you know, you can affirm that calling the function will successfully cause a pub sub um, if you're using one. So you know, it, it, it's got its ups and downs. In this example specifically, it's not sort of immediately clear to an outside viewer why calling timeline.create post will cause the live view to update. Like we know implicitly that calling our create post will update the view because uh, we expect creating a post to make it show up on the timeline. But if you're someone outside of the code base who hasn't uh, got any familiarity with Twitter, then you sort of don't really understand this. It's not declarative. Um, so, you know, they all have their downsides. What method do you use here? And um, something really helpful that I have been taught is we ask ourselves a set of questions about our tests to sort of help determine the best kind of testing we can use for our messaging here. So should the test fail if the application no longer broadcasts a message? Well, I would think yes. Um, now, in this case, only calling our core domain safeguards against this. Uh, question two, should the test fail if we move the pub sub implementation? I would think not, um, as long as the functionality is remaining the same. So we only have a failure here with the core domain if we do move the pub sub, upsides and downsides. Should the test fail if the post creation requirements change? So, you know, adding a new field in our schema? Uh, probably not, no, not in this case anyway. Um, so again, only calling our core domain fails here. And should the test fail if we change the broadcast topic and message format? I should think so, that, that changes our message uh, quite prominently. And again, only calling our core domain safeguards us here. So we're in a bit of a situation where, you know, you've got these upsides and downsides, and it seems like core domain is doing some things that we want, but some things we really don't want. So what do we do here? Well, let's mix it up a bit. So the ideal solution for something like this is kind of a tweaked version of our pub sub call. Um, because our direct approach is kind of prone to those false positives and it's quite brittle. Um, and calling the core domain directly couples our tests really tightly to our, our, our schema. We kind of want a nice middle ground and we can get this by taking a kind of combined approach. So calling the pub sub broadcast from the tests as I showed you previously, it can be flaky because we've got the topic hard coded and we've got the message hard coded and changing that in our uh, tests, uh, sorry, in our actual implementation can mean that the, the tests are prone to false positives. But if we put these two things in a central location and take them out of the test directly, we then make our tests less brittle. And this also lets us decouple our testing more than we would with our core domain, which is very tightly coupled to the schema. So we've got this timeline module in our uh, Twitter app that sort of shows you your, uh, well, your user timeline with all of your posts. Now, uh, this has our subscription topic, which is just timeline. Um, and we've now created a function that's called broadcast post created that sort of handles that pub sub inside of it, um, which means that now our improved test, we can still insert our posts for our test using X machina like we did previously, but instead of calling timeline um, dot create post directly with our timeline topic hard coded in there and our post our message format we are calling the actual function that will be implemented in our app itself. And therefore it's more true to life. Uh, we don't have these nasty hard-coded strings that make it really brittle. We don't have the hard-coded message format. So those things changing in that function should still make this pass. Um, and then once again, we're asserting that uh, our view now has the new posts notice where it's show new posts. Um, which happens when broadcasts are sent via pub, pub sub in this app. So 
Some key takeaways. When you're testing content that renders dynamically, you always have to render your view to create a, a live view rather than testing your static HTML because your static HTML may not be accurate to the stateful changes that are being made to your components. Using data role or similar, so data test is what we use, is similar for targeting DOM elements that don't have any other unique identifiers that you could hook into. This is rarely the case, I should say, because you can use either the CSS selectors or your regex expressions, which gives you kind of a whole realm of possibilities, but it can be useful um, when you don't have those options. And where possible, you should replicate your app's actual functionality uh, in your tests as closely as possible, but still remain decoupled where you can, uh, as we saw with that last refactoring example. Um, yeah, cheers, that's sort of it. Um, once again, I'm Dino Creator on Twitter, if anyone wants to uh, come ping me. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Awesome, thanks Theo. Has anyone got any questions? Yes, I've got a question, Theo. Uh, how uh, how extreme down the TDD path have you been going with Live View? Um, and what I mean by that, to clarify, is that there uh, I have heard of people that build user interfaces without ever running them in Dev. That only only through they only interact with them through test unit tests. Uh, how how close are you getting to that uh, Nirvana? Ivory Tower. <laughs> uh, not quite there yet. At the moment, obviously at work, we, we uh, have built our sort of project uh, quite deep, deeply as, as quite well, uh, well idealized and it's very much functioning and we sort of don't have a lot of that testing. So we didn't do TDD with that, but in personal projects, um, definitely not to the level that you're talking of, but I have been trying to be persistent with writing my tests for a given module. Um, that's generally how I'm grouping it, making that module and then going back and adding tests if need be, but generally doing it module by module. Um, and then sort of at the end, going back in and covering any interactions that I might have missed. So yeah, definitely not quite to the level you're talking of, but uh, it sounds interesting. I, I'd be curious to see how they've implemented that and how they're doing that, because that's intense. It is. Watch this space. Theo, yeah. have you had a look at, um, I guess, exercising live views via, I guess, feature testing frameworks, like I think Wallaby within Elixir or like maybe Cypress or something like that? Yeah, so Cypress is something that we were considering on our project at the moment because we have this uh, kind of intricate drag and drop functionality that does need testing. It's not something I've had time to sink my teeth into yet. Um, I personally do you think I want to look into Wallaby first because it looks quite interesting what they're doing and I know it's very well respected in the Elixir community as quite a robust testing framework so yeah um not yet but it's definitely the next step for me I think cool nice thanks